Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming out on this lovely sunny afternoon. I'm sure you'll find it's well worthwhile. We're always pleased to welcome Martin to give one of his talks. Before he does, the, there's the usual housekeeping business. We're not expecting any fire alarms, but there are exits at both sides at the back of the theatre, and I think that's just a story. So there's two at the back and on, on each side. Uh, toilets, if you go outside and turn into the cafe and then keep turning right, you, it's not very far, but you have to make about three right turns and you would eventually find the toilets that you could use. Uh, I think that's, oh, thingy, the, what's they called, mobile phones, silent as, as well, please. Thank you. Uh, a little bit of trust housekeeping. Um, we're, we're always pleased to welcome new members. I don't know if there are any non-trust members here today. But, ah, good. Very welcome. Uh, I've brought some spare copies of our latest bulletin, which are down at the front here. You won't have received one. You're very welcome to take one afterwards. And um, anybody else who would like a spare copy, please take one. And we're very pleased to have with us, sitting modestly at the back, Robert Banks, the, the author of the supplement about the, his house in, in Allegate. That's, that's also a feature of the latest bulletin. So the front of it, as, as you will know if you, you've seen it, is taken up with, with advertising this talk. And I don't need to say very much more than its title is Up the Wooden Hill, A History of the Staircase in Durham and the Wider Northeast. It's a great pleasure to welcome Martin Roberts. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, and can I also thank you for coming? Um, I, I was tempted to stay in my garden this afternoon and give my apologies, and but for the fact that John would never speak to me again, I would have stayed there. Um, so thank you for turning out, and I hope you can go back to your garden soon. Um, uh, up the Wooden Hill, I was talking to Matthew about this before. Uh, it was... Uh, I only got the first half of it. I had to Google when I, in my early 70s, uh, the second half to Bedfordshire, because I never got that. I just got up the wooden hill. And I thought, what's the origin of that? Because that was my sort of childhood memories of being carried upstairs by my mother. Um, so I thought this was an appropriate title. Um, the, the initial draft of producing this uh, 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 produced about 150 slides of staircases and you would have gone mad and I was going slightly mad and I thought how am I going to condense this down because you are in for quite a lot of staircases very subtle variations on them I hope um, but uh, I want to explain a little bit about the the, the um, aesthetic modifications that move a staircase from let's say the black stairs here in Durham to the much lighter uh, and, and, and elegant staircases of the early 19th century. So we're, we're going on a sort of chronological journey. Um, I hope, oh, hang on. Why isn't it going? Hang on. Sure. I can do it this Sorry, way. I think my daughter wants to speak. Oh, have you, right, okay. That's work. Brilliant, right, okay. So, I mean, we, we have to start with this. Uh, Francis Johnson, did this This is my second copy, but it's available. I mean, you see, these are, if you haven't got one, and older members know that, well, it's got 75p on A Books. You, you subscribe to A Books thinking that you're avoiding Amazon. Of course, they're all owned, everything's owned by Amazon. That's the trouble, but uh, uh, they're still available. Um, and, and yeah, Francis Johnson, I bought mine in about 1976 when I, uh, first came to Durham as conservation officer in 74, and it's been a bit of a Bible ever since. Um, and so, uh, in a sense, uh, there are qualifications to make, you know, 50 years on uh, to what Johnson says. And I remember Royal Commission people from York saying, oh, I don't, this dating's right at all. Well, that was people from York looking at Durham staircases, and there's a whole variation in style and, and when certain features are adopted. Uh, between places like York and and, uh, uh, and Durham, and you will see even within the county, there are some examples I'll show you where they're doing something differently in Sunderland from what they're doing in Durham. And if you think, well, if they only got got together, they could introduce or, or pick up a modification and improvement. 
uh, if, if the Sunderland folk had just come over to Durham for, for, a, for a while. So I want to talk about the, the, the aesthetic changes in the staircase over what what are we talking about late 12th uh, sorry late, late 17th to early 19th um looking a little bit before then because there are some examples of staircases in the county that predate the earliest staircases the earliest late 17th century staircases in durham uh, and it's good to know about those um but we need to know first of all how the staircase sat in the, the, the in the house plan because that dictates very much um, um the importance that's attached at various times in history to the staircase. Early on, essentially, it is lurking in the shadows. It's, it's, it's at the back of the house. It, it, it's, it's not uh, a prominent. And as it, over the centuries, is brought forward and into the centre of the plan and certainly into the entrance hall, the more it becomes a, a, an item of um, concentration for designers and artists because it, it's front and centre. It's the thing you, that impresses people, certainly from the early 18th century onwards. Uh, and uh, so, so people give it a great deal of attention in terms of design, that that's what they want to impress. I mean, there isn't, for example, I, again, because it would have been heading towards 150 slides, I haven't got any photographs of, uh, of staircases in Stockton. The ones I've seen in Stockton are really rather blousy and in your face and rather showy. And, 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 I, and so I keep on thinking, well, are all these staircases along the Bailey? Is, is that simply, you know, lawyers and, and, and the Eden family or what? Well, the Eden family is an impressive one. But, you know, are, are these sort of the more re restrained gentry families not uh, uh, showing off? Whereas you go into some Stockton houses, trade, you think, they're, they're, they're showing off the magnificence of their staircase front and centre right at the, at the entrance of the building. Uh, so there are these variations going on. Um, so let's let's start looking at plans. This, this is just one I plucked at random. This is, this is a rural farmhouse in Walsingham. Uh, relevant, I, I think, because it shows uh, the, the way staircases used to be uh, and the way they were in the 18th century. Um, right, okay, this is, uh, let's do the ground floor. This is Wiserly Hall, originally probably a, a, uh, uh, a, a long house, maybe the medieval long house, and then later uh, a half passage uh, coming into the hall and parlour. This is the critical bit. You come in at the side of the fireplace and this little offset here is where the original staircase would have been for the main house. It would have been a little winder stair, ex exactly like this one at the low end, the service end. And it was been here and it would be very cramped. How, how you've got the double bed up there, I'm not quite sure, but anyway, we won't worry about that. But, but this was the access to the first floor and it was there and you would emerge into the various chambers and so on. By the mid 18th century, this was becoming obsolete uh, and a brand new wing was put on primarily for a big dog leg stair. So, I mean, that, that simply covers it. You can't make it prominent. You can't make it front of house in, in the middle of the, uh, Weirdale. But, but that shows the contrast between the original arrangement of, of a very tight timber winder stair uh, and, uh, and a much larger and more generous dog leg stair. Just again, to, to look at what we've got in Durham, a couple of examples keep you. Um, it, and the deanery, very similar in date. This is a medieval stair. Basically, basically we're talking about uh, access of a spiral staircase here, which would have gone up into the roof. This is the reconstruction of the 16th century, I think. Uh, and here's the deanery, same sort of dates, um, possibly the work of John Lewin, and, uh, and a similar staircase. So, that, so the termination of that would have been very similar to that, um, but quite cramped. I mean, architecturally, they become quite important these these stair turrets because you can articulate the massing of the building and we'll touch a little on that but that's a whole different subject and particularly the elizabethans love to do that but in terms of the internal uh, amenity of going up between floors it was always pretty cramped uh, keep here i mentioned simply because uh, this is the ground floor classical loggia of a three-story um, building post dissolution of keep your hospital don't know the date. Um, is it John Heath the first? Is it John Heath the second? It could be two dates in the late 16th century, conceivably even John Heath the third into the 17th century. But let's say it could be about 1590. There are records that this, when it was a, a, a pub in towards the end of the 19th century called Keep Your Inn, had a fine oak staircase going upstairs. So you think, oh, is this an Elizabethan staircase? Uh, probably not, because we do know that the first floor here had a wonderful uh, panelled room full of what I would call cousin woodwork. I mean, it was almost certainly one of Cousins, Bishop Cousins craftsmen in the late 17th century. So my best guess would be that this door, which clearly originally went into a, 
uh, a late 16th century stair was quite a simple stair uh, and that it was replaced with an oak staircase at the same time as that panel room was put in. Um, the simple fact of the matter is there's no Elizabethan staircases in County Durham uh, now, timber staircases surviving. Whether there ever had been, uh, we'll, we'll, we can just conjecture. Um, but I did mention that the way that a stair turret, which is on plan, can be quite, quite narrow, but is a very useful vertical feature when you're articulating the form of, a, uh, of an Elizabethan house, the way it can help. And here we have two turrets in, in, in the angle. This is a U-shaped house, Midridge Grange. This is the reconstruction of it. Um, and the, what they call extruded corners, where in the angle between two ranges, you put a little stair turret or even just a closet range. Uh, the way that can articulate the plan is quite important. And we'll see that at, uh, in a moment at, at Gainford. Um, just another couple of plans, again, to show that late on, I mean, again, we're in lots of parts of the country in 1592, for example, you might expect to see some timber staircases. Here at Unsbank, we're still putting in, and sorry, this is a 1554 range, this is the 1592 range, and they're still putting stone spirals in. No hint of, of a timber staircase at all. Um, uh, and this is the view, this is the approach you get. Uh, again, an ex, this is what they call like an extruded corner, where you're taking the corner out and making it into a vertical feature. That went right up into the roof, probably to a long gallery, uh, and uh, it was set to one side of a very symmetrical arrangement of, of doors and windows. There is a missing range here. Uh, and one just purely conjectures whether that missing range had a similar extruded corner. They were very common uh, in Elizabethan houses to articulate uh, and, and define and frame uh, the central entrance, which of course has a little plaque where there would have been a coat of arms or, or, or date stone of some sort. Rogerly, I simply show it. This is another building altogether. This is gone. It was demolished in 1948, but I've done a kind of tried to do a reconstruction. Um, and this certainly had an internal staircase, and we know from the sale of the furniture in 1930, prior to its demolition, that this was a stone staircase. Now, for reasons I won't go into, but I mean, we think the date range is about 1590 to 1610. And in a sense, that 1610 date is dictated by the fact that they're still using stone staircases uh, in County Durham, whereas in other parts of the country, you might expect to see an Elizabethan timber stair. Not to say they didn't exist, but uh, there's no record of any surviving. Um, and then you get this building, and this is the same plan as Rogerly or a variation on it. Fantastic Gainford Hall, uh, amazing on all sorts of levels. Uh, and here there are stair turrets, not a single stair, uh, but actually what they do, they free up the plan. This is, this is Piano and Rogers uh, Pompidou Centre, you know, 300, 300 years before, 400 years before. It takes us, if you put the staircase into the plan of this building, it really cobbles, really messes it up, basically. And if you take the circulation to the outside of the building in the same way that the Pompidou Centre takes the services and the staircases outside the building, it frees up the ground floor, particularly on the south side, to have a hole and parlour. Uh, but here you've just got tur turrets, no, no scope for spatial effects, for, for grand balustrades and all the rest. But what this does, by putting it at each side, it also solves the problem inherent in this plan form called a double pile, that you can get a nice front with a porch, you get a nice porch to the back, uh, but at the side you have basically an M roof of the door, two, two double pitches, and an awful sort of duality right in the middle. You put your uh, staircase over the ends, as it were. A, you free up the internal space completely, uh, and you you um, you articulate the building. You've got four nice elements to articulate the massing of this building. So again, it's terribly sophisticated in all sorts of ways. But that's, uh, we're just going to touch on that. But again, no timber staircase, even in those little turrets. Now by 1662, we move into, into Durham City and, and Bishop Cousin, uh, revamping, reordering uh, the, the much damaged uh, and neglected Durham Castle during the Commonwealth period. Uh, and like lots of people, um, inheriting a medieval castle, which had spiral staircases here, spirals here, and then uh, uh, Tunstall's, Bishop Tunstall's, gallery and, and much improved staircase, but it's still very cramped, relatively speaking. And Cousin, at the critical point between two big ranges, puts in uh, this wonderful staircase, which really uh, transformed uh, and, and set a precedent for all sorts of copies. Uh, and, um, uh, 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 well, it's, it's, it's the lots of homages, as it were, in Durham to, to the Black Stair. 
We don't know who did the black stare. I think I had on that early slide craftsman and dates. This is the problem. Um, if we've got a dendro date for the building, we might have a dendro date for the stair. And so that's useful. And I've got some specific dates which are useful. Um, and that helps a, a, a attempt a chronology, as it were, of staircases as they change over a couple of centuries. Um, craftsmen, um, I've done a sort of uh, uh, list of 17th century craftsmen, and in amongst them, I mean, and they're mainly down to cousins, contracts and records and his day book and so on. These same 17th century craftsmen, late 17th century craftsmen working in the city will almost certainly have been doing some of these staircases I'm going to illustrate. But I mean, I have got no record of, 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 you know, which one is doing which. That needs some analysis of the owners of the houses and their family papers and all the rest of it. Um, but that's the problem with craftsmen. We, we, into the 18th century, again, even worse in some ways. I know one or two joiners. Um, we all do, as it were. But um, uh, there's no, been ex no extensive research. And you, you were talking about secular rather than religious buildings. And the research there hasn't been done. And just... As I say, in all the locations of those staircases have been pretty backward and remote. And then suddenly, this is Newton Hall. This is the plan of Newton Hall, which was, you know, stood where the, the modern, is it Leach Estate, Barrett's Estate, built in the 60s. The hall was demolished in 1928, uh, and it was a, a new building. Well, modification, anyway, there was, a, there was an earlier Newton Hall, but it was pretty much a new building of 1717. Uh, to 1723. This is the plan which is now in Sheffield, uh, Wentworth Woodhouse Muniments, because of the Liddell family, uh, all the documents. I can thank Roger Norris for this, <laughs> bless him, because Roger invited me to the launch of Peter Meadows and Edward Waterston's Lost Houses of County Durham donkeys years ago. And I met them and I got talking about Newton Hall. And I can't remember what it was Peter or Edward said. I said, Where's the Newton Hall stuff? And he said, Oh, it's all in Sheffield, the Wentworth Woodhouse Muniments. Because the Henry Little's son, John Bright, married a Bright, basically changed his name to inherit her fortune, and that moved to Yorkshire. So there are masses of Newport stuff uh, to be found in, in Sheffield. And I have good fortune. My wife came from Sheffield. I spent many happy hours transcribing Henry Little's letters uh, while my daughter did gymnastics at Teesdale School. You don't need to know that, but I mean, you've got an hour to kill. It's a good thing to do. Um, and that's been really useful. And this is the plan. Possibly by William Etty. We don't know who the architect of Newton Hall was, but here's the, 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 the elevation. You've probably seen one photograph, particularly of Newton Hall uh, from the avenue. This is the wider front, main entrance, entrance hall, and bang in the middle is the staircase. Uh, well, it looks as if that's going up in one flight rather than St. John's. And, and again, we'll, we'll come on to talk about that, but uh, it looks as if it's not dog legging. So it's an impressive staircase. It's making a statement. And whatever the staircase is coming to the front of the house, you, you've got to pay attention. It's also, you think about it, the only space in the house that's likely to be two stories. So the, the architectural potential of, of creative spaces, of, of moving in, through staircases that are complex and interesting, you can achieve that best, as it were, in the staircase, as, as we shall see. Oops, sorry. Um, this is always uh, touted as the earliest staircase in Durham. Uh, it's the one in Crook Hall, and, and I've not been to Crook Hall since the National Trust uh, took it over. So I guess they haven't done any dendro ones. I think you probably could do some dendro chronology and maybe get a date out of it. It's a very rough, as you see, just a rough, um, a rough box, timber box, triangulated, put on carriage pieces. And I think uh, Johnson and others have thought 16th century, late 16th century. It, you know, it could be anything. Really. It could be late medieval, uh, but I don't think it's any any later than that because once you move into the 17th century, we're beginning to get. Uh, timber staircases which have had some pretension um, but also tucked at the back of the uh, this one tucked at the back of the service wing um, the solar end has, has gone that sort of starts us off on our journey so let's look at the emergence of timber staircases in uh, in the county first of all because between 1620 and 1660 I think in Durham City we don't have any staircases I can be sure of um, and the two that come to mind uh, are Raby Castle Kitchen, and here we have a useful date because um, the, uh, uh, the Bows took it, was it Bows or the Vane? I think the Bows took it over in 1626, or was it George Vane? Sorry, somebody will correct me. I'm looking at Adrian. The Vane. It's the Vane, right, sorry, okay. The Vane's took it over in, in it's, that's right, because George Bows had it after the rising of the North, didn't he? 1626, the Vane's took it over, coming up from London. And then we've got all sorts of modifications. And bless me, in the kitchen, we've got this nice little uh, short flight of stairs. Um, 
with a pattern, and this is where we get into uh, Anirakish detail, and be warned, there's a lot of this to follow. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, and there's a, bit of, there's a bit of glossary occasionally as well, uh, this is what's called a mirror baluster. Now, uh, and I had a friend from English Heritage came up to do some family history last week, and we had an interesting uh, uh, um, tour around Bransford where his, his uh, great-grandmother was in service, and he said, I've only got two problems with your peasantry, he says. He said, one is, what the dickens is a mirror baluster? And I said, well, my editor, when I explained what one was to my editor, he said, well, can we call it a horizontally symmetrical uh, baluster? I said, that's a bit mouthy. So I went to the vernacular architecture group's glossary of terms, uh, and Linda Hall calls it, uh, calls it a mirror baluster. And if you want to know what a mirror baluster is, that's a mirror baluster. <laughs> this, this is all that's left of Thistlington Hall, where the DMV was excavated by David Austin. And basically, you could do it that, and it, it, it's the same either way. It's symmetrical about there. Uh, and uh, and if you get an, I was at Norton Conyers for the la launch of the North Yorkshire Pesner only yesterday, uh, and they've got mirror balusters, but they're calling them in their Pesner. Well, they're calling them vertically symmetrical. I think this is horizontally symmetrical, isn't it? All balusters are vertically symmetrical. So it's that way. Well, it, whatever, whatever. Do you think it's horizontal or? Anyway, whatever. This, this is a mirror balusters. The, <laughs> the other thing he said to me. And this is a rather, this is a man from Guildford. He said, I couldn't understand you were talking about Neptune and all these pants. What's a pant? And I said, well, I told him what it was, your water supply, whatever you're going to call it. And so, and, and so I had to Google pants. And of course, it's a Scottish term that's coming south. So it was unknown to him. So we, we're going to have to, with the next reprint, put a little uh, modification as to pants. You can't put pant in the glossary of a Pesner because that's a sacrosanct thing devised by Pesner himself. Uh, and you can't add in local <laughs> colloquial terms or regional terms. So there'll have to be a little thing about pants and mirror balusters. Uh, this, this was recorded, this is interesting. It's, uh, there are plenty of archeologists present. I'm sure I'm gonna say something rude about them. Um, uh, I, I know um, Nick Molyneux, one of my colleagues was on the dig, which David Austin carried out at, at uh, Thistlington. And they, they bored it in Thistlington Hall, which was then pretty much a derelict building. So they were kind of sleeping on the floor. And they did an immense, if you've got the, 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 the uh, excavation report, every stone of the medieval village was, was documented and detailed and drawn. Did they record the building they were sleeping in? No, it disappeared without trace. I, I went out with Bev Bagnall, when it was just about to disappear, and I, I grabbed this from the ruins, and I, I tenderly stroke it <laughs> like a worry blanket from time to time. Uh, but I think it's all that's left of, again, an early 17th century, I think, probably a 1620s building. Because, um, well, there's another one uh, that's gone. And here, I don't have any photographs. This is a, a, an object lesson. Don't leave slides in your car when you're doing, you're doing a WA class and you park in Leesy's Bowl car park and you go off to your WA class. Uh, and when you come back, you realize your car's been stolen uh, and your slides have gone as well. So, you make, so I, after then, I didn't kind of mind losing the slides, but the demolition of Old Hall St. Helens Auckland, which I photographed as they were swinging the ball at it, uh, I regret losing my slides. So uh, always keep your slides closer to you. Well, but we're digital now, so we don't need to worry if unless somebody can get to the cloud. Um, but here again, uh, an early 17th century staircase, uh, mirror balusters, you'll notice that, that there's a joint in it. And I think that's because the staircase now is a dogleg stair, which we'll look at a dogleg stair, but it was originally a well stair. It went around a, an open space. Well stairs are better, as we'll see, because they allow for some sort of appreciation of the space and, and the experience of going up a well stair it is much better than going up a, a dogleg stair. But that's at least I did get a record of it before it disappeared. Martin, what do you mean by a well stair? I'll, I'll show you a photograph in a minute. I'll, I'll come Interestingly enough, I think a lot of this went across the road to William Whitfield. So William Whitfield's house, as the Douglas will know, is right opposite uh, where this was demolished. And so William came across and took all sorts of stuff, panelling and whatever. Now, I, I know, I think the house has been sold yet. Andrew Lockwood, his, his partner, is still in the process of selling it. I just wonder whether in the basement uh, there are bits and pieces uh, of this. Some went to John Niven's house at the old hall, uh, but uh, a lot of the woodwork went to uh, Sir William Whitfield's house. One of the things, of, and, and one, of, one of the good things about putting a PowerPoint together is that you pull all these images together and you suddenly make discoveries and you think, oh gosh, I haven't seen that relationship before. So that they can be very um, useful exercises. I had done this uh, previously, looking at the turning of balusters. And here we're not talking about staircases, but it's exactly the same craftsmen who are making staircases are making um, choir stalls here. And this is 
1629, because we've got Ralph, Ralph Eden putting a date in a, in a little plaque around the corner there. And Egglescliffe, again, church warns the counts, telling us that these turned balusters uh, for the pews are, uh, were inserted in 1639. That's jolly useful, because if we transpose that to staircases, we can, I think, reasonably assume that, particularly in the 1620s, it seems that mirror balusters were quite popular. And, and they don't seem to exist in the 1630s. But it's a little nuanced uh, uh, development that one can record. Generally speaking, these disappear. But we'll see one or two crop up. OK. Um, uh, sorry, this is terribly colloquial. Up front, bold and beefy. I mean, <laughs> that's just a kind of way of trying to summarise what I think are these some of these 17th century staircases were all about. Um, well, I suppose just before we get to the black stair, we should mention this one. This is a terrible photocopy uh, and then a scan, but the original photograph is in the National Monuments record in Swindon. Uh, and this is the Royal Commission getting wind of the fact that Hothwell College were about to uh, demolish the farmhouse. I had to sit through a public inquiry when, when, when I was at the city, uh, when uh, they were trying to demolish, county trying to demolish High Hothwell, and the then head of, and I'm probably speaking ill of the dead here, forgive me, please forgive me, Warwick Percy was bragging before the public inquiry about how he'd, how he'd hoodwinked to the county council into demolishing this building, which was the main farmhouse of Hothwell. Uh, and then he got it down before Fred Bickerton, as he said, could get to me. Uh, this was the farmhouse. A brilliant set of plans by Cording Liam McIntyre, the cathedral architect. The, their plans are archaeologically very accurate, and, and I've redrawn some of them, but basically they can be trusted, I think, in terms of wall thickness, which can be. So we've got a good record of the building, quite a lot of photographs, and even some interiors. It is thought that this was built during the Commonwealth period, quite a rare time for, for building, unless it's sort of Auckland Castle and so on. But um, Gilbert Marshall is mentioned. 60, so that sometime in 1650, 1660, possibly, this is an early, uh, an early uh, staircase um, coming down in, into, well, ignore that, I think it's later, later stuff, but that's basically the main entrance hall. So a showy, it's, it's coming down, it's projecting into the entrance hall, beginning to say that it's coming out of the shadows in the back of the building and it's being presented and therefore it's, it's incumbent upon the designers, the joiners, to do something that is, is meant to impress. That's what it's all about. Um, yeah, but, but none, none of it survives uh, at all, but uh, at least we have a pretty good visual record. Um, just to mention staircases and, and get our, our, uh, our, our terms right, a dog leg stair is a stair that goes up to a half landing and then immediately returns and comes back on itself. Um, most of the staircases in Durham uh, uh, you find of, of the run of the mill sort tend to be dog leg stairs. Uh, and um, they don't allow a great deal uh, of, of display, uh, creation of space and so on. This is interesting. It's a dog leg stair at uh, Ramshaw Hall, which is a fascinating building. Um, and the, the reason is because, it, well, I can't go into it in great detail, but essentially I think it's Anthony Pearson. There's a, there's a strong Quaker connection in, Ram, in Ramshaw Hall, possibly Ramshaw Hall, the rebuild of the Elizabethan house, was done by John Langstaff, who was the, the, the master mason at Auckland Castle. Uh, and he had rights to the, he also, he, he did a lot of building and demolishing and rebuilding, poor man. And then he ended up demolishing the house he built for Hazel Rig in the Commonwealth period. And he had rights to the materials. And so you find at this building, which I think is possibly by uh, John uh, uh, Langstaff, that this, uh, you have to take my word for it, there are sections where the, the, the balusters are joined together. So it's rather like that. Uh, drawing I showed before, there are joints in it, and it, it looks as if it might be reused. So it's an outside chance this might have come from Hazel Riggs' house, which of course, when his cousin arrived at Auckland Castle, he wanted to get rid of it. So he said to John Langstaff, I know you've just designed this and built it, now I want you to demolish it uh, and, and clear it out and, and then rejig re the old hall as the as a chapel. So this possibly is a, um, a Commonwealth stair as well. Uh, again, a sort of a, a, a mirror baluster, if you switch those around. And one of the central problems, one of the central aesthetic problems is, and we'll come to this, is, is what you do when you turn around. When you swing around, uh, you'll see how the difference in height between that handrail and that handrail. Uh, there's a massive discrepancy because you're going up sort of two steps, basically, in, in, in very little space. And so well, for, the, for a long time, best part of 100 years, they simply put two newels together, newels being these things here, put them side by side. But in the search for 
a greater aesthetic appreciation, a refinement, elegance in the staircase. This was, was a cumbersome arrangement, as we'll see. Okay, we, we reached the black stair, and here we're talking about a well stair, which is which is going round the central space, which is kept clear, uh, and, and this gives you massive opportunities for for creation of space and and movement through buildings and, and movement through buildings and appreciating internal space is all about what architecture is all about. So this is where the staircase, the cliff, it's front and centre, uh, is such a sort of focus for for uh, craftsmanship and design and so on. No idea who built the black stairs. Um, we probably do, in the sense we know who the craftsmen are, because they're there in the contracts. And so any any one of four or five people who are listed as doing work at Auckland and, and at Durham could be the people, but we don't have a contract for the black stairs themselves. We do for the stonework outside. Um, but this is a, ma a magnificent staircase, uh, and it's uh, clever in all sorts of ways. And uh, John mentioned in the notes that I had a knee up, and ever since the last 10 years, I've been very careful going up downstairs to hold on to handrails. You, you do, don't you, with older age, you, you ignore them and just go leaping down the centre of the stair in your youth. But handrails are quite important, just in case your leg goes. This is a brilliantly ergonomic stair, because basically if, if the 17th century stair is a high roll, the most common one, and that is normally set centrally on the handrail. But the cousin stair, it's tilted over. It's literally moved over, very ergonomically brilliant, because it just, when you think about it, you're, you're, you're going, going downstairs like that, it's actually quite awkward. What you really want to do is, is you go stair, downstairs like that. And so to, to help you, the, the, the carver and, and the joiner has mo moved the hand rail over to one side. Only one other example I know of this, uh, and it's, uh, it's a very appropriate one. Um, Bishop Cousin, of course, had a chaplain. Oh, sorry, this, this is an old black and white, but I think some of the detail on this is fantastic. Interesting, and again, we'll come on to another staircase of this lavishness. Um, these carved balustrades were, were relatively flat on the inside, and they were much more uh, deeply carved on the inside for display, so that you could look across the well and see the face of the opposite flight. And of course, anything that projected too much on the inside was going to nag your trousers or your dress or whatever. So they all have two sides to them, these carved balustrades. Um, and interestingly, George Davenport was Cousin's chaplain, and he had his own living at Horton the Spring. And in the rectory is a staircase that we know from his uh, letters he, he built in 1665 and 6, so three or four years after, uh, after the Black Stairs. Again, he's actually gone back to, to mirror balusters, which is a bit unusual, but they're quite bulbous ones. Uh, but if you notice the handrail, it, it's the only other handrail I've come across where it's tilted over. It's a bit of an homage to his boss, uh, because if you'll see, that's not rising centrally from the handrail, it's, 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 it's over to one side. So the, if you see it over here, it comes right up against the post, right up against the post, otherwise it would be here, but it's over here. But very, very convenient. As you'll see, there's some staircases in Durham where if you do feel your legs going, you're in serious trouble because there's no way you can grip the handrail. Um, while we're talking about uh, staircases with, with carved balustrade, and we're talking about the, the top-notch stairs now, Horden Hall is one of the most interesting examples. There is a piece at the Bose Museum hanging on the wall, bottom, um, and they have a lot in store. Um, now, there's two people I know. I don't know if they each know they're studying the same thing, but Lee Prosser, uh, the Royal Palaces uh, and uh, Richard Morris, a uh, former colleague of mine, I think the Heritage, are both studying these, these carved balustrades of predominantly of the late 17th century period, sometimes a little bit earlier. Um, Horden is interesting because uh, it was extant in Horden Hall and, and the hall is still extant and standing. Um, and then the staircase came out, leaving a bit, I was told, at Horden Hall, and, and I know Adrian's been in it. I, I asked four times and wrote three times, and I've never got in the building yet, so I had to make it up, as it were, from descriptions, and thankfully from Adrian's account of Horden Hall. Um, so there might be a little bit left at Horden Hall. A lot of it went to the to Castle Eden, and the elements went to the Bowes Museum. When I went and asked the current owner of Castle Eden, did they have any of this? He said no, and I think a previous owner, and I have my suspicions who that is, uh, sold it. <laughs> so it's not there. Uh, it's not because it's, if it's ex situ, it's not part of the listed building. You can't nobble people if it's just sitting in a, in a, in a stable somewhere. And we've lost it. But what the bows have got is what they've got on display, and they've also got a lot more stuff. And when Lee Prother came up, he, he said, can I see everything you've got? 
and Howard Cooch, bless him, phoned me and said, do you want to see the whole lock? And we're laying it all out for him. Uh, and they've got you know, probably three times as much as what they've got on the wall here. But it's incredibly good quality. You can see the, the detail of it. I, I dare I say it's almost better than the Black Stairs in terms of the richness of the carving. Um, again, late 17th century, so it's all we can say. I uh, don't have a precise date for it, but a, a wonderful staircase. Um, and this is my own home village. The Manor House in West Auckland's got a pretty good one as well, um, uh, which goes right the way to the roof, oh, by the way, because often you find that staircases in the 17th, 17th century will stop halfway, as it were, because they've got to the principal floor. This one goes right to the roof. And, and the suspicion being, in this quality, I should say, that the, the Eden family, and this is their, this is their home, uh, did go to the leads, go up onto the leads. Uh, I've seen places where people are going up to watch the hunt. They, 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 the, 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 the wives and the, the women will watch the hunt from the top. So the staircase have to be good all the way up. Um, uh, whether there was something around West Auckland, I have no idea. But certainly the quality continues to the top floor. It doesn't stop at the first floor. I'm kind of vague, still vaguely intrigued by this kind of splat like it, it, It's almost as if they've done a design of what they wanted to carve and they've ended up just threat cutting it, if you see what I mean. Uh, although it's got marks on it. And I then began to think, well, then actually, have somebody suddenly cut off the carving when they wanted to put a flat panel over, when it wasn't fashionable to have richly carved. So I, I, you see what I mean? There's the little nicks in this, which make me wonder whether, in fact, somebody's very assiduously just completely planed it all off and then put a flat panel to try and make it more modest, more, more, more simpler, which, which was the way staircase designs were going. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's there, and it certainly does belong in the building. Um, one that, again, putting these things together, kind of interesting. Um, black stairs, the Newell post there with a bay leaf design, overlapping bay leaves, basically. Identical one, uh, West Auckland Manor House. Uh, in every detail, leading to the little uh, the concave moulding around. And also that tied in with a piece of wood I found in 8 Sadler Street yonks ago. Um, it was being converted to shoals. You know, it's, it's the building on the corner of Elvet Bridge when you're going down the hill. And it's, it looks to be an early 19th century building. Uh, it's got a, probably a medieval basement. It's got a 17th century back, certainly, from, the, uh, from what used to be the car park. Um, and uh, this piece of wood was clearly, I think, a new post that didn't work or was rotten or was recycled. It, it might be on dado panelling, but exactly the same design. Um, and I uh, took it out of the building and measured it up at home and gave it to Dennis Jones, and I think it's in the house. I hope it's in the house centre, yes. Good. Uh, so, again, not saying it's the same craftsman. It's simply saying that bay leaf panels on the old posts were very popular, and it could be by three totally different craftsmen. We don't know. Um, this is a bit of an homage to, to the Black Stairs. This is Six Day, the college, got a small building, uh, and a quite small staircase, but uh, richly carved, more crudely carved than the Black Stairs. Um, these are either, of course, single bind twists, or and again, I think it's a, it's a generational thing. You, you and I would think perhaps of barley sugars, because barley sugar always used to be that shape, didn't it, when you bought it in the sweet shop. Um, I think a modern generation or modern listers wouldn't, wouldn't call it barley sugar. Um, uh, but this is it, and, and these, what they're called rinceau, it's a sort of uh, swirling vegetative design uh, is very much what you see on the cousin woodwork at, um, uh, at Auckland Castle and the choir screen. Um, so it's that very popular. So we're talking about the same 1660, 17, 1680, can't be precise. Uh, well, after 1662, which is the date of the Black Stairs. Um, now, this is the one that everybody in Durham thought came from Loch Levin Castle, if you remember. This is the one that was introduced into the Royal County Hotel. A recent study, and I've not seen the study, but I was told that the origin has definitely been ascribed to Stoughton Grange, a building demolished, I think, in 1926. And the then owners of the Royal County uh, uh, got this and, and installed it. Um, I'll mention now, before I forget, that next door, and what I'm convinced was, was a house designed by, well, sort of convinced was a house designed by James Payne, the other Bowes house, basically. There's obviously, there was, there was four... South Bailey at St. John's College, but the other uh, Bowes house was this one. It has all the makings of a rather simple but nice James Payne design. It's certainly had wonderful, uh, we are told, uh, Rococo plaster work by, by uh, Philip Danielli, 17, 1750, 1760. Uh, and it had a staircase, which, which Francis Johnson raves about, quite frankly. He didn't photograph it, and I'll come on to that, but he, in the book, 
well, I suspect it was photographed, it's gone. Uh, you would have needed listed bill consent for it, but between 1970, uh, uh, it, it's not there now, basically. And I'm pretty, well, it, pretty sure it didn't happen on my watch. <laughs> that. Uh, when it was removed, I don't know. Maybe they removed it without listed bill consent. Dare I suggest that the Royal County, heaven forbid. Um, okay, just a bit of a glossary of terms again. This is um, this is the Bose staircase, and we'll return to this. Uh, barley sugars, balusters, bind twist when they're more elegant. If you think of bindweed wrapping itself around a stem, uh, you wouldn't think of something as chunky as this. So I think that the barley sugar becomes bind twist after a while. Newell obviously is, is, is the turning point on the stair. Uh, flat handrail, pretty obvious. Uh, close string. Uh, the strings are the uh, sides of the supporting structure. Most of these staircases are, are not as modern staircases, are, are made where the structure is part of the, the actual face of the stair and, and, and the riser and so on. And, and again, riser is the vertical bit, the, the horizontal, the depth of the stairs called the going. Um, and up until early 18th century, all these strings are closed uh, and molded in the classical manner with cornice and frieze and so on. This one's quite plain. We'll return to this one, but uh, the original staircase there, probably put in by the Bowes, they acquired the lease on this in 1689, so that would fit in with some modifications to, to the barley sugar balusters. Barley sugar balusters stick around for a long time, I think probably 30, 40 years. This is the brute that if your leg goes, you, you're lost, because all you can do is just hug there's no way, there's nothing to get a hole. You, can't, you just have to grab it, you know. Um, it is probably the, well, this is where Beefy comes from. I mean, after, after the, bra the Black Stairs in the castle, um, this is real, uh, the scale of this is vast. And you, you could, if you've never seen it, just, dare I say it, pop your head into, say, Comfort Society. They'll tell you to get out after a while, but you've seen this because it's literally inside the front door. Um, I think this is the Wharton family. I'm looking at Adrian. I think I, I, somebody was, um, the people I was showing around Durham, uh, my friends, he declared a, a day, and he was looking at all, all the places that he wanted to go to, Brownsburg, where his uh, family were in, in service. He said, my wife, however, just to mention, was a Wharton. Uh, and it turns out she was a direct descendant of Thomas and Robert Wharton, the famous doctors and so on, and lived at Old Park. So we rushed out to Old Park yesterday to see, see that. And this was their townhouse, I believe, because they went and looked at some efforts. And again, they said, how do we get in? I said, well, just walk in. They'll throw you out eventually. But I mean, if you want to see this, it's right front and center in the middle of the building. Bow string, barley sugar balusters, but just a hail of it is, is, is so impressive. Um, the, the, the depressing thing about 12 South Bailey, and it's the one that when you get panoramas from Winnie Hill, uh, done by Bock and then by Buck, uh, well, the, the two buildings, not in the first one, but the two buildings that stand out on the Eden House, which is now St. John's College main building, uh, and at the very bottom of the bay, lead, number 12, this one, it, it rises head and shoulders above, above all the rest of the buildings. Um, and we've lost what must have been very high quality, uh, again, late 17th century rooms off this, but this is, this is uh, it, it's, it's great that this survives. More modestly, 22 North Bailey. And again, this, I suppose, is what I put this in because it's a fairly typical 17th century stair. It's not got the beefiness of that uh, uh, St. Cuthbert's Society one. Um, Again, the, the, the history of these balusters is they're getting less chunky and getting more elegant. And, and that summarizes what happens to the staircase over a period of 200 years. A raised rail, so it's, it's a practical uh, uh, thing to hold on to. And it's got, uh, uh, got ball finials and it possibly had pendant drops. Uh, they're easy to take them off. And by the time you get to the 18th century, if you've got a staircase with ball finials and pendant drops, they are deeply unfashionable. So the easiest thing is to lop them off. I mean, you don't want to completely rebuild your staircase. Uh, uh, but I mean, these things get very, and there's plenty of evidence for these coming off and caps going on. And if the cap's loose, you can just lift the cap off and see the dowel where the original ball finial sat in the middle. But I think it's easier. I think pen and drop tend to drop off by gravity. Uh, uh, and there, there would need to be something to finish that off. Um, uh, but again, molded, molded handrail, very practical. Um, a little bit more sophistication here again, a closed string, but the closed string is, 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 is fashioned a little bit uh, like a, a classical entablature. Got, got a, a dental cornice here. This is what's called a pulvinated frieze, a sort of bulge. 
uh, you get that on door cases and all sorts of, and architraves and so on uh, in the period. Um, and, and St. Chad's, I mean, it has to be said, St. Chad's has got a fantastic collection of uh, staircases, and that's really what inspired Johnson. I mean, he must have seen about eight or nine in Chad's, and he sort of thought, well, I'll do a more detailed study uh, while I'm here. And, and thankfully, despite all the modifications that have gone on in Chad's, and sometimes it's very careful conservation, sometimes it's conservation with Johnson adding an extension, and of course, on the very corner, it's, it's pure Johnson in, an, in a new build. Um, the, the staircases are always respected because he was a, he was a, a great architect. Met him. I met him once. I met I, I met Pace the year before, and George Pace is as arrogant as people said he was, but he was a great architect. Don't get me wrong, but not the kind of bloke you want to go and have a you know a meal with. <laughs> Francis Johnson was lovely. He had a brown suit on. He had a little. He had a, watch and everything else and I kind of wanted to adopt him as a grandfather he was a really very chatty friendly chap a nice guy um just to put us out of Durham and take us a little bit wider just into Yorkshire and every time somebody from your know, southern friends wants to mock the northeast they obviously and if they want to mock the northeast they'll usually pick on Middlesbrough let's be honest or Sunderland <laughs> generally speaking just mind them of Acklam Acklam's got the best um, well, okay, Black Stairs, notwithstanding, we've already got the best late 17th century staircase in the northeast of England, certainly. This is stunning. Um, and I don't know what it is now. It was a school when I got involved with English Heritage, when more about the development in the parkland. But this is magnificent. A double bind twist. So you've got this bit sort of double helix, basically. Um, very, you know, this is posh and very expensive to do. Very rich. Um, I, I don't know, I think these are artichokes, aren't they? I never said no pineapples, but uh, as in back stairs. But grade one, of course, Acklam Hall, Middlesbrough, on the south side of the river. Um, just when people are saying, oh, Middlesbrough, you know, wipe it off the map, it's a big joke. It's not. I think it's a great town, actually. I've got a lot of time and good people there. Um, but this is magnificent. So uh, just just say, just Google Acklam and, and put, balance up the importance of Middlesbrough in cultural heritage terms. Um, well, this is deanery. This is in the north side of the deanery. Um, and whether they weren't bothered about fashion, prevailing deans, I don't know when, it, or it might be this is a 19th century restoration of features, but this has got the works and everything. It's got a high rail, so it's got like a high gripping rail, uh, and it's got ball finials and it's got pendant drops. Nice details throughout. Um, and again, late, we don't have a date. Um, we, you know, I, whether we were not a, well, we may have a range of dates for the dean that put this in, but um, and that would probably be recorded. I'm looking at Pat now. Would it be recorded in the chapter Acts books? I'm guessing. Would it? I don't know. Not chapter Acts. It was his business personally. Oh right. Okay. Okay. Well, there we go. So we don't have a date. I mean, some of these things can be dendro dated. I mean, you're a bit tricky because you're really looking for bark on dendrochronology. But I mean, things like Prudder Castle Gates, which are quite refined, got quite a close date. But if you know that this is, let's say. 1660 to 1680, let's say, then and, and you're going to be missing the sapwood and missing the bark, you're going to get a plus and minus figure, which could be 20 or 30 years anyway. So you, you, it's not worth doing it, if you know what I mean. Martin, is there anything in the book done by G Dean Kitchen in about 1912 about the deanery? There possibly is. I don't know. I've not double checked, but I mean, there could well, well be. I mean, I, th I think there might, might be, a, be there might well be a range of dates. Yes. I mean, because you. We tend to be lumping these together and saying from 1660s, and we assume that kind of cousin kickstarted everything, but don't forget that Hoffel staircase was there before, possibly. And then round about 1700, things are changing stylistically, but a lot of these have very similar sort of stout little uh, baluster uh, or, or, or bind to it, uh, a raised rail. Uh, this is Hilton, which I recorded with the National Architects Group many years ago. Um, and again, a rather sophisticated handrail, but, but again, the same principle, at least you can grip something. Uh, and a rather what I call sort of pie crust thing, you know, the way you put your thumb around a, around a or with a fork around the pie, uh, the, uh, the little detail here. Um, this is now dark grey. <laughs> They've just restored this. We're very good radio states. And, and, um, uh, I, and Lady Barnard was insistent. That, I mean, I just went along to, to chat to Lord Barnard about it. I had no, no capacity, but he said you'd be interested in seeing it. And she was quite adamant it wanted to be dark grey, which of course is the colour that everything is. You know, if you've ever gone through Pierce Bridge, the worst painted house in County Durham, 
just on the edge, is the pub at the end of Pierce Bridge, where the entire elevation, and it's a great place to eat, I'm not knocking it, but the entire elevation, Sashi's, is in shades of dark grey. What a depressing sight it is. Anyway, she wanted dark grey, and who was I to argue? It's not my business to get involved with that. Dark grey, of course, might have been the original colour, because originally these, these uh, staircases, what they're trying to emulate here, are classical staircases in, 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 in a courtyard in, in a palazzo in, in Italy. And, and initially, many of them, whatever wood they are made of, uh, were, were painted dark grey for stone colour. Um, I went to one in Marlborough, which was, which was reconstructed, and, and sure enough, it was recorded and then painted as a dark grey colour. They were trying to fob you off that it was stone. In fact, it was cheap oak, as it were, as the alternative. They really were like a stone staircase. So who knows? So for, for this next 20 years, 30 years, it's going to be dark grey and then somebody else will come along and whack another coat of paint on. They wanted to strip it off. And I did say, don't strip it down to the bare wood because that's not good. And I shouldn't say that because my good friend John Niven did that at, at uh, Old Hall where it was painted an appalling colour and it still needs a little bit of richness and perhaps even the new owners will repaint it. The beauty of this is we've got a date for it of 1670, 71, a dendro date for the building or the, the half of the building that was added in 1670, 71. So that's very good stylistically. We've got, we know, we've got a date we can hang our hat on, as it were. High rail. Interesting that John did strip it down because it's actually made of two different woods. Now, I noticed that, that Francis Johnson says that the black stair is made of deal. Uh, uh, I don't know that we know that. I, at one point, I was told the archaeology department were doing an examination of the wood of the black stair and thought it might be all sorts of things like chestnut and oak and whatever. This is certainly a mix of two woods. It's for the, for the structural elements, for the main decorative elements, it's oak. But for those smaller little mouldings you see here in the panel, they're all in pine. So you put it together and you've got two different woods. So you need to stain it initially, whether you paint it dark gray and stone, but even just applying a, a stain, as was done with lots of cousin woodwork. Um, his artist, Jan van Essel, was, was, was often allowed to, to paint, paint with trail work, I think, in the castle case. So they're, they're clearly unifying perhaps with two different woods to give it an even dark color. Anyway, this is a good, uh, a good staircase in terms of the data. We've got all the details. Now, um, what then happens is that um, I've explained this problem of getting round the corner on a half landing between a staircase that's, that's doing that and the next one is starting there and there's a gap of two foot in between. And what they really wanted to do was to try and get the impression of a continuous rail, especially if you've got a well. If you've got an open space and you go up to a newel, hit the newel visually, up to another one, another newel, up again, hit it, 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 it interrupts the flow of what you're after. Um, and so the answer was to get over the ramping problem. Uh, and this is where I introduced a staircase which, which Francis Johnson didn't mention because it didn't, wasn't known to exist. And it was one of my fun days at English Heritage. The Anderson staircase, Anderson Place was a great mansion just off Pilgrim Street. Uh, this is Kipps, Niff and Kipps illustration. Of, this is Pilgrim Street in the foreground, big front garden. This is where Grey Street is now. It's roughly where Lloyd's Bank is in Grey Street and the Theatre Royal and so on. Developed obviously by Granger and Dobson. Um, now we can be fairly precise on this because Niff and Kip, I'll explain what it is if anybody wants to know afterwards, but basically this was a publication of gardens, essentially houses and particularly gardens. And we know that although it was published in 1707, all the drawings were done because Niff and Kip say so by 1703, but about 60 of them were done before 1600, so uh, 1700. So maybe there's, I don't know, 10 years in which they were accumulating all these wonderful bird's eye views of houses and gardens. They got the king involved to, to put in a couple of his houses in. And then all you need to do is tout around all the gentry and say, we're doing a book of all the uh, all the uh, the great houses in the country. And we've got a couple of the kings. Would you like to be in? Well, of course you want to be in. <laughs> so they signed up straight away. Uh, and you've got, and I put this very crudely, you've got something like two or three, and I can't remember the precise number, but you've got two or three really good, eight, let's say, A2 prints. And you've got about 50 A3 prints. So basically, when you had guests, they would just say, here, look, here's my, thank you for staying with us. Here's my illustration of the gardens, which is why they're accurate. People say Niff and Kip is often made up. I think in one case, there is a wing that wasn't recorded. That's what I understand. But by and large, they, he's drawing what, what people saw. And what we're interested in is these blocks here, which are, A, they've got sash windows, which 
This is very early for sash windows, uh, as this is pre-1703. Uh, this is the Elizabethan house that's been blocked out and extended and so on, Jacobean period. These were added around about 1690, 1700. And in them was a staircase, the Anderson Place staircase. And when Granger and Dobson were demolishing this in the 1820s and 30s, the staircase was taken out because Dobson was working at Brinkman Priory and he wanted to put the staircase in at Brinkman Priory. Uh, what he did was not put it in at Brinkman Priory because he, the correspondence says that the balusters, the verticals, these things were missing um, and therefore he, they couldn't reconstruct it. And then somebody said, oh, no, it is, it is in, uh, it is in uh, uh, Brinkman Priory. And, I, and when I was a DH, I was the inspector for it. And, and they said this was the stair. Well, it's not. This is a dead ringer for an 1810 stair. It's a lovely little delicate Regency thing. We know from illustrations, because Carl Michael did a sketch, which was later engraved, that that was where the wing was going to go. And that was where the Anderson Place staircase, a big well staircase, was going to go in the middle. Uh, at the same time, the stables was being converted by the owners, English Holy Joe and the actual church, and one of the few sites they actually own rather than have the guardianship of. Um, and in the roof, I suddenly saw things laid across the tie beam of the stables. And a lot of it was just straight timber, I couldn't make head and tail of it, but some of it was this, which looked like a ramped handrail. So, this is the great thing about English Heritage, you can get six people to lay it all out on the grass at English Heritage and have the fun day of your life. Look at all the pieces, about 150 pieces of a staircase. This is the Anderson Place staircase. What do we do with it? We've humped it all the way up to Brinkman, shove it in the stable where it stays for basically 150 years, basically just lying in the attic there. Um, this is now in the house, at least. A lot of collections people at English Heritage wanted to take it to Hemsley, where we have a store, a bit like Ikea, you know, where you can have it. Okay, right. I sort of thought, it may well be there now, I fought like mad to keep this in the building as much as possible, because one day you could reconstruct this. Um, I was able to, when I was uh, doing the Brinkman Guide, but I did all this uh, in my own, own time because I wasn't meant to be doing Brinkman Guides. You can draw it all up. The beauty of it is there is a ghost of the balusters. Do you see there on the left-hand side? This is the newel post, which had been stained, well, they'd already put on a half baluster, and of course that didn't receive the same. So when that came off, you got the ghost mark of, of the baluster, which is that. So, you, so I can do those kind of drawings. What I can't do is the sexy stuff, and you put it together like that. Um, and that's what was done down in Swindon by the Royal Commission people. Uh, and what you've got is a transition, getting rid of the newel, where you come up, and in order to get up to the next level, that tricky bit of getting around that corner, Otherwise, you just go up to there and then you start again from there. You ramp, and this is a ramp, and you ramp up to the top of the newel, get rid of those ball finials and stuff like that. And so you're beginning to go up. up uh, it gets a bit awkward there, doesn't it? But I mean, that's basically the transition, which seems to be very late 17th century into the first decade of the 18th century. The only problem is when you do, and you, you won't see many stairs like this now because what they tended to do, as we'll see, was get rid of this. This is the awkward bit, visually. It's just a great infilling of the round section because they've continued the same baluster height underneath, okay? Still got the close string, by the way, and ball finials and all the rest of it. Um, and you find it elsewhere in the same date. This is the Manor House at Sedgefield, been documented. Uh, 1707 is the date in the building uh, over the door, I think, but the, the owners have researched it, and 1705 is the start date. This is likely to be 17, 1707, obviously, when the building is, is watertight completely. Single bind twist, and they've got the same block. Not very attractive, to be honest, but it, it gets you, it doesn't mean, at least mean that the handrail continues on in a sort of manner like that, but, but, a, but a little bit awkward. So we're in transition. Um, and then, right and rectory. We've got two dates for this uh, in the building, over the door 1709 and the 1678 date. Um, well, if you remember, double bind twists at, at 1684 at, um, uh, yeah. at, at uh, Ackland, so it could be that, but there's no way that is 1684, 1678. I think this is all 1709. This is why I say the bind twist stuck around for 30 or 40 years. Um, a flatter handrail, very much a Georgian handrail, not a 17th century handrail, but the same problem of, of you get up to the right level on the newel, but you get this, this blocking effect. Um, well, I think there might be one more. Yes, this is quite a bit later, 1720, Sunderland. They weren't catching on in Sunderland, what, what the <laughs> developments were. 
no, no, no disrespect. I'm, this is, I'm not having a go at them, doing it. Everybody else does. Um, this is really interesting. I mean, it's good because it's a staircase in the church, and the church has got precise dates, so it dates the staircase pretty much. Uh, and, and again, a type of stair you, you won't see in Durham. So this is where we've got variations across the county. This is where an open string, where, where, where basically that band which hid the structure of the staircase, it, now the, the, the actual structure of every individual step uh, is expressed. And here it's actually projecting. And I can't think of one in Durham that projects like this. Um, <laughs> and this is, uh, and again, William Etty has been suggested, he's always suggested as a possible architect, he's in and around. Um, so here we've got an open string, which is the new fashion, as it were, coming in, uh, what they call a curtail stair, where, where, step, where the step is swept out at the bottom for a sort of rather smart post. And again, the same problem, well, the same attempt to get over the, the big mule and by going up there and ramping there. And, and that's pretty awkward, really. Visually, it's not very satisfactory, but it's, it's showing the direction in which people want to travel. So we come to the next big staircase, and, and this is um, St. John's. Um, this is Eden House, I think. Uh, the dates are pretty good. Uh, 1721, the Eden has got the lease of, of three South Bailey. And in 1723, um, Buck draws it from Winnie Hill, and, and the, the house is there. So that at least dates the building. I mean, I wouldn't say that the staircase might not have been fitted in 1724 and 25, but the bulk of the building is, is that precise date. And here we're, we're echoing, well, we're, we're, we're uh, developing what was happening generally about making the, the staircase a feature, double height, space, entry, hall, entrance hall, and following London models, uh, which I'm not sure precisely when they came in, but we are following London here, of having one single flight going straight up into the, to the main floor. Um, possibly, uh, and, and we're not then continuing on up to the upper floors. The upper floors, you go to a different staircase. Often it's the service stair, which is itself quite posh. Often the service stair is entirely independent for the servants up and down the building. And there is a second staircase for the family, but not obviously continuing this staircase, because the problem is if you start to return a flight up to the second floor, you're losing the architectural effect of, of having one double height room with this gorgeous staircase. And of course, here we've got an open, open string, as they call it, uh, and these spandrels individually. And this, this, is, this is good money, this is, because I mean, this is individually carved. Every baluster is individually carved. It's not simply a question of turning it on the lathe. Uh, so uh, as, as uh, Francis Johnson rightly says, this kind of revolutionizes in terms of Durham staircases, the design. Uh, and we've got some elegance, we've got the ramping, and you'll see what they've done. They've got rid of uh, that block there simply by extending the height of the column. This is a column on vase baluster. So if you extend the height uh, up to there, uh, you basically get rid of that awful block work, which was in those transitional stairs of 1700, 1709 and so on. Um, this is about the same time. This is Streetlum. Um, Streetlum, uh, again, staircase is likely to be 1725. The building accounts start in 1717. Um, only slight difference here is that uh, they've kept the, the heights of the column vases about the same. They've got these rather extended blocks. Uh, what they later did, and St. John's did it, was they, they, they stretched this up so that you didn't get this rather attenuated sort of detail here. But what they've done, they've got rid of that awful block that was underneath. Them. And so we're beginning to get what they really want, which is the eye going continuously around this space and an architectural space of, of some significance. Um, and of course, this was uh, demolished in the 20s and then a bit left, and uh, the Pease family got the Territorial Army to blow the rest up in 1958 or something. An impressive job, <laughs> but sad. But a lot of those sales of uh, material, Jonathan uh, uh, Peacock's done a lot of research on the building, and there was a very good exhibition on Streetland at the Bows in the last few years. Um, just to bring us again, I've got a date of 1736 in my mind. I've, I've not seen what the National Trust Guide said. This is thought to be 1730, 1740, that wonderful crook hall which starts medieval and goes 17th century and then 18th century in two phases. And this, again, uh, a really ornate staircase. Again, it's called a curtail. It develops more, but a little swirl at the bottom. And this is the curtail step at the bottom and the open string. Uh, a, a, a dog leg, you know, you're limited to what you can do, but at least it returns... Uh, fairly sharply and, and a very attractive handrail and uh, baluster. 
This is Pontop Hall. Uh, the building dates are meant to be 1710, 1720. I, I wonder whether this is the right date for this staircase or whether it isn't a bit later. Um, it's very fine. To begin with, it's got three balusters per fence. It's posh. Um, most of them got two. Uh, this has got three. Uh, again, they've, they've dealt with the um, uh, with the, uh, the, the block uh, on the ramping. Uh, okay, uh, there's still a new one. This is carved new now. But again, you're beginning to get at the top of the stairs some continuity, and so this 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 aspiration to get the the line of that handrail, particularly the dark wood over over lighter woodwork, sort of snaking up the building, is is, is taking shape. Pontop was one of the places where. Uh, Usher started. There's a chapel here where, where, in the early years before they actually moved to Usher, where the uh, the, the community from Douay have a small college here. It's near it's near um, Stanley. Um, another thing you could do uh, at five North Bailey, which I think is Saint. It's it's a bit of a it's an outlier. It's his Saint Chad. I'm looking at Douglas. Is it Saint Chad's Douglas? Like, yes. It is. It's, it's not in the main block, is it? Is it what sort of separate one? Possibly. Anyway, the the, the Sort of details here are a combined mule. Uh, you can make a combined mule on the corner uh, to make it look a bit more unified. And, and again, open string, but just the block, a simple block uh, at the end of the stair um, coming through an express. Uh, and you go back to two, two balusters per tread here. This is just a poor shot of, of a, and it represents what I get the wavy rail staircase. This is Mugwump. Uh, which you'll know well, uh, Peter Jackson's building. Um, and somebody, one joiner, one assumes, was doing a, quite a cheap staircase, let's be honest, the wavy rail staircase. Normally there's a second wavy rail down here, but I wonder whether that's been replaced at some point. But there are half a dozen of these in the town. I've got a list somewhere. Um, or Crossgate, where Mike Williams used to live, uh, you know, the house next, just above St. Margaret's, uh, has got one. So it's kind of mid-18th century. Uh, but uh, very being, well, relatively simple, uh, not particularly prestigious. On occasions, you'll get the wavy rail added at the top of the building. So you'll have the posh building, the posh on the ground on the first floor, and then to go up to the attic, you, they'll cut costs and put a wavy rail in. But uh, it seems to be the, the signature of, of, of one particular joiner. Um, I put this in because Francis Johnson likes it a lot. Um, he says the baluster is some of the most refined and delicate in the city. Um, 40, is that history? No, not. Yeah. Yes, it is history. Is it, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's on, you know, on the right going down to the Bailey. Uh, little curtail again, just not a full sweep, but a nice, delicate. Uh, and, and again, there's some open plan here because it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not a dog leg, so there's the opportunity to present it, as it were, uh, very refined uh, turnings and so on. And the, the, the open string almost joining, but not quite, which we'll come on to. Oh no, um, before we come on to that continuous spandrel treatment, I'm just leaving the city because one thing that surprised me doing person was going to places which have got overlapping balustrades. I can't think of any in Durham that have got this. This is where your dog leg is so tight that, that you haven't even got room for a little sort of newel and starting the flight over here. You've got the next flight happening over the top. So the next flight up sits on top of, uh, of this. This is the Queen's Head in, in uh, and in, again, a, a mid 18th century building. Uh, I've got a closed string again. So, so closed strings, they're easier to do, quite frankly. They're cheaper to do. So, if, if you can do a closed string rather than do a, an open string with all that delicate uh, carving, then uh, that's much better. Um, now, <laughs> this is the Bose house. And I've, I've got to say, maybe I'm wrong, but I've got a theory about the Bows and, and the Burdens and the Heath, three Durham families. They like their gardens before they like their houses. Um, if you know, Hardwick, the Burdens did have a plan for a house from James Payne. They spent all their money on their temples and their lakes and their grottos and their Gothic ruins and all of it. And they, I, I don't know whether they just ran out of cash or ran out of steam. They never built the house. If you think of uh, Gibside, I would argue that um, that Gibside is is all garden and and the house is kind of magnificent. But it's I would almost find it rather depressing compared to the great avenues and all the, the buildings in, in in the landscape and so on. Um, and here, they, they certainly took the, seem to take the lease of this very wide and very long uh, garden below what is now St. John's College and what St. John's called Principal's Walk now. And yet their house, and, and Margot Johnson wrote a lovely uh, monograph on, on this house and St. Mary the Less yonks ago. Um, and basically, this was a cobbled together medieval tenement. 
And all they could do, all they wanted to do, I mean, they could have done it, or they could have demolished it like the Edens next door did later on and build a brand new house, couldn't they? But they didn't. They, they said, we want the old, but saying, let's do the garden uh, and we'll make do with this house. But they took one chamber, of course, which, which is the Tristram room, and did a magnificent uh, 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 Rococo ceiling inside. So this is magnificent. But they managed the rest in what is a, a, an accumulation of alleyways and small rooms and so on, but with a big garden. Um, and yet, when they were doing this, right next outside was a rather archaic staircase. You see those, those little uh, uh, barley sugar balusters? That's the late 17th century, probably after 1689, because they got to lease them. Maybe it was sentiment that said, we could afford to take the staircase out and put a brand new 1750s, 1760s staircase to go in the room. All they did was take the, what was undoubtedly a ball finial off the top and put a little cap on carved with the same detail that you find all around the skirting boards in this building but they put a little carved cap on and they did exactly the same for the staircase in the, the missing Bose uh, family staircase in in, uh, uh, in the in the Royal County so I, I, I thought initially they were just being parsimonious but I think maybe it's sentiment maybe you know this was the Bose family saying granddad put this staircase in in 1690 so to respect that we'll just alter the top and modernize the top this rail is very, very flat. I'm, I'm suspicious of this. You'd normally have a bit of a camber on it, something. It almost looks like that's been slapped in later on. But uh, but essentially, it's, it's the late 17th century staircase with that very clever modification around about 1750. Um, this, I mean, it, it doesn't have any particular claim to fame, apart from a very beautiful staircase. Um, 19 North Bay, I don't know which college we're on there. Anyway, uh, is that chance? Thank you. Um, this is lovely. Uh, it, it just climbs very, I mean, it, we, we've got to accept the moment we've still got this problem with the ramping and it doesn't go up continuously, but this marches very nicely. It's a sort of well stair and then it kind of, on plan, it kicks across, so we get a slightly asymmetrical uh, uh, space, but uh, it's, it's a very handsome staircase. I mentioned about open strings with what they call spandrel, shaped spandrel. Spandrel is that sort of triangular bit you get underneath the stair once you've decided to express individual steps. Um, and in Durham, what Francis Johnson points out is that sometimes they pull these further across and ran them in together. And so you get a continuous spandrel effect. This is Hatfield College, the D stair, which is the old block at Hatfield. Again, sort of mid 18th century development. Now we're getting towards the end now and we go here for even a simple, greater simplicity of line and, and a greater complexity. And this is just humdinger of a staircase. This is Croxdale. I've seen it several times and, and it never ceases to be a rather jaw-dropping staircase because in some ways it, it's a contrast. This, this is the first, well, one of the first times stick balusters up here. And stick balusters suddenly do away with all that moulding and turned baluster. And they hang around for the next certainly 60, 70 years, right through the Regency period. And the rail is getting thinner. And then the curtail is getting more pronounced the way that is swept round, big wide curtail steps. Uh, and, uh, and again, the ramping, but, but very delicate ramping. And this is an imperial staircase. This is, I mean, Bird Hall's got them and, and major houses tend to have them. Central staircase splits on, on landings and then returns uh, to a, a balcony uh, uh, on the top. So that's a lovely staircase. And it's got a very rich Rococo ceiling by Cortese. So in a sense, there's a kind of nice contrast here that the richness and, and indeed the richness of the old paintings and so on on the walls is kind of counterbalanced by this really cool, uh, incredibly elegant uh, uh, staircase at Croxdale. And this one too, this is Hampstead Hall, um, which at Hampstead Mill, not the Hampstead uh, uh, Teesdale way. And this is the other Hampstead on the sort of concert um, road at Chester Way. Um, Probably the building designed by Henry Swinburne, who owned it, um, and restored brilliantly by the uh, uh, the Spry family recently, um, had elements of it added by Lord Gort. But this was always a perfect uh, 18th century Gothic uh, staircase. Uh, it's obviously got the wraps on at the moment because of the redecoration, but a very fine staircase, and and offset by these gorgeous uh, Gothic uh, Gothic, as it were, windows. And the building dates 67 to 774. Um, then, as with everything, furniture, uh, uh, we get this chinoiserie element, so it's sometimes called Chinese Chippendale when it's applied to furniture. Uh, but I hope the left hand 
staircase is still there. This is taken from Francis Johnson's book. I've never seen it. Um, this is the one he refers to as being Chinese Chippendale. It's, I mean, you get more complicated ones. This is, is really quite a simple lattice. This one, which I would roughly say is the same date and is an attempt to be Chinese Chippendale, is, is a lot cruder. I put in Broughton and Furness because my brother-in-law had a house, my sister-in-law had a house there, and Broughton and Furness, the square there, was laid out as a planned settlement in 1764, and at least two, I've been in every house around the square, but at least two of them have got really delicate Chinese Chippendale. So, in 1764, everybody was talking Chinese. So that point I'm making, I don't have an illustration of that, sadly. But uh, there you go. Right, the last stage, stage, minimalism, I call it, not, not a term they would recognise, but it's this, this search for this beautiful snaking line. Um, and this is one of the best. Um, this is Woodlands. Thomas White, and this is, he was, this is his house, was a landscape designer uh, and a stage uh, designer contemporary and worked for Capability Brown, um, a very notable man, a, a book on Thomas White has been published. And um, what he did, he got, he, he worked with great architects. He was doing the landscaping for houses that were being designed by John Carr of York and Robert Adam. And he obviously said to them, could you just knock up a house plan for me? Because I'm going to rebuild a house at Woodlands, which is just outside in, in that big Manchester parish. Um, and so we've got plans from John Carr. And then that plan is pretty much adopted by Robert Adam, but it extended with wings and so on. And in the end, Thomas White said, well, thanks chaps, you know, I think I'll get, take all the good ideas and I'll just build my own house. But what, what runs through all of them, and John Carr is the first to suggest it, is that the staircase hall is absolutely at the end, it's semicircular on plan. And rather than have a half landing where you'd go up a staircase, it's like a dog leg stair, have a half landing and return. He, he carries this, this is very clever joinery, I mean, because it appears just Float across uh, uh, the, the window at the end. I also wonder whether, and this is actually on the outside, two windows with a band of stonework. I wonder whether Carr and Adam might have wanted to have a single glazed window all the way down, which you often do get. And I just think this is Thomas White maybe sort of chipping out because that actually slightly irritates me aesthetically. But what you can see, and you can see that the curve of this wall is this gorgeous sweep, and it. it it's not really cantilever because it, it, with clever joinery, you could actually span timbers across there, uh, and then that's carrying the upper flight. But it's, it's very, very elegantly done. And it's, it's the hangover from Carr and Adam uh, in Thomas's, uh, uh, Thomas White's house. And his garden is a little miniature capability brown landscape, too. Um, this one I came across, uh, this is. The old vicarage game for when you go to the church, uh, the, the extension was built. We know it, it, it is, the dates are controlled by the vicar who was uh, uh, an incumbent there between 1824 and 40. And we're getting towards the end of really um, the, the, uh, the stick baluster because come the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, the Victorians taking over and they're going back to rather lumpy um, uh, turned balusters. And so this elegance, this, this Regency elegance, but which was around in 1760, um, certainly at Croxdale, uh, is coming to an end, but very beautiful staircase. Because the, the front part of the house and the back part of the house are on different levels, there is a half landing. So the complexity that adds with this other stair is, is really lovely. It just works very well, uh, again, given that two story height. Um, as does this. Uh, this reminds me of 13 South Bailey, which was a house I think that the Lord Ramsay lived in briefly, Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and uh, then also Margaret Johnson, I think, as well, I'm released from somewhere. Dean um, Tam Dean Archbishop Tam Ramsey lived in 16. Oh, maybe this is 16. Maybe I'm wrong. It's well, the eight, one on the eight, right. eight is on the left as you go down with a, a steep flight of stairs. Uh, step yeah, oh, yes, no, yes, this is, yeah. But, uh, I and, they, this... and, th and 16 is on the other side, is the big one that is now being used by Cranmer Hall. Right, and that's just beyond Next the new Next to library. that ghastly library, yes. Quite like it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we can discuss that later. Yeah, okay, 16, I mean, 16 must be where Margot lived as well, I think, for a while. Yes. Yeah, right, okay. And it, this has an asymmetrical staircase where you, you just follow the line of this mahogany rail. And, and again, we're talking mahogany now. As, as a so is this... Eight. This is eight. This is definitely eight. I haven't got a photograph of no. 16. Sorry, it wasn't 13. You're right, it's 16. But again, the same principle applies. It's been rather spoiled by the need to, need to brace it later on. So we've got all these restraints coming across, which are holding it together. Uh, but it's a very elegant staircase. And, and we're getting to what they were aspiring to do, which was minimal stick balusters and just a, a, a line through space. Uh, and finishing at this one, which is one of my favorite buildings on the Bailey. 
Um, and Francis Johnson, this could it be Bonamy? I mean, Bonamy's living in South Bailey. He's got his office in North Bailey. It's the right date for him, 1820s or something like that. Uh, the rail is, is, is not totally oval in section. It's still got a little bit of a vertical element to it, but it's, it's, you can see we've got no ramping. The ramping's been removed, stick balusters, uh, open string with a little bit of decoration there. Uh, and, and the whole thing is set into a, an oval entrance hall, top lit, uh, lovely door case outside. And, and I think it's, I get the feeling it's a total rebuild. They demolished so many buildings, as you know, have uh, been refaced and altered, but there's no feeling of any older building in here than this 1820s one. Uh, and so Bonamy must be in, in the possible frame for this. I finish with this, and this intrigues me. I don't know why I was reading your newsletter of 2005. I made the fatal mistake, and I should have read the introduction that uh, Dr. Gibby put in this in this book, um, of thinking that, that Francis Johnson photographed all these staircases. And I was keen to see the, the one that was lost in the Royal County. So I contacted Francis Johnson's practice. They said it was all gone to Hull University. I got the catalog from Hull University, and there's no mention of staircase photographs. Well, I could have just answered my question because here, uh, basically, uh, Mr. Dr. Gibby is saying that Anthony Davis took the photographs and he was a trustee and he was uh, alive until 2005. And his many photographs of Durham's staircases will be his most lasting legacy. It, it, it does, does the Davis family still exist in Durham or have they left? Because it seems to me that, that Tony Davis had all the photographs of all these uh, staircases many of which obviously survive, but the, the, we've lost the one at um, the Royal County, and I'm sure someone in the Royal County has a photograph of it, or different owners ago. I know there's been one at St. John's, two, uh, two, two South Bailey has lost the staircase. I think Johnson describes two, there's only one now. Um, so it would just be wonderful to think that somewhere the Davis family still has Tony Davis's photographic archive, and that there are hundreds of photographs from which uh, Francis Thompson selected the photographs of this one and leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Are there questions for Martin? <laughs> I feel as though I've been sitting in a revision lecture where <laughs> I remembered 90% of that or not. Um, questions at all? What about the back stairs, you mentioned that a bit. Yeah. But how often are these houses, do they have back stairs as well, particularly the townhouses? I think, well, they would, from a practical point of view, St. John's must have had one because it's only got one staircase going up to the first floor and there are the higher floors. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I could, I've read that there are instances where the service there from the first floor got you up to the upper floors, but you, if you put it bluntly, you're sharing that with your servants. I suppose if you had a, a, a generous enough floor plan, you'd have your grand St. John's Eden House staircase to the first floor. You'd have a service stair that was going up and down was quite rudimentary. Um, and ideally, you'd probably have a second stair for the, the house and the family to go from the first floor to the upper floor. I think the one that springs to mind where I think that exists is the um, wonderful 55 Westgate Road, which has got fantastic Rococo plasterwork. It's part of the Newcastle Arts Center, I think, um, and that is um, is a fantastic house. I mean, it's got full of Rococo plasterwork, and I think and Grace and Grace McCombe first showed it to me, um, and I, I had the same experience with um, Richard um, Hobbs at Bransworth with showing my friends. You know that you've all probably seen the staircase at Bransworth. It's the imperial staircase, which is behind the, the sort of the plywood door, and of course he, he <laughs> as we approached it, Richard shut it, and I knew what he was going to do because he didn't want them to see inside. So he could say, "Oh, this is this is my next project. Open the door." And this unbelievable staircase goes up and then round the back in, in Bransworth. Um, and, and Grace McCombe did exactly the same thing with me in Fifty Five West Kerry. Awful plywood door. Open it in the most gorgeous uh, mid eighteenth century staircase with rococo plasterwork and and got iron balustrading as well. Incredibly high quality. But I think there's a second private stair for this family to go higher up the building. Thank you. In the Lincolnshire. There are one or two quite decent farmhouses that had nothing but a fixed ladder until well after 1945. Did, did that happen in County Durham? Well, I mean, some of the stack, I mean, yes, pretty much. I mean, I, I didn't 
do too much vernacular. I just showed wisely. Uh, I mean, there is uh, like a peak field is, is a very similar plan of house. And, and you can always tell where the stair was because instead of the door being right in the corner, uh, you know, between the fireplace and the wall, there's always a gap and it's about a three foot gap. And you know that's where there's been a winder stair. Uh, and it's always a timber stair. And, and Peakfield, there's a little cupboard, it's like a closet. And you go in and you think, well, how the dickens did they get up? And it must have been an incredibly tight, very high, high riser stair. So almost like a ladder stair, you're right, yes. Yeah. Which, which begs the question, furniture. How do you get your furniture up, yeah, up on the quite. first floor? You can't, it's not Ikea, you can't dismantle it all and well, take it up. Well, I guess the beds were, were taken yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, 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 okay. The farmhouse I've ex-farmhouse I stayed in in Lincolnshire um, had a first floor that until a modern staircase was put in just was a big open space like a lot mm -hmm. you know even though it had yes walls. yes my recollection is and I could be wrong on this but the one of the few one of the, uh, the, the faculty records as, uh, as Pat will know are all in in, in uh, uh, Palace Green and uh, sorry in um, uh, yes in the the uh, the base building at the back and so on. And uh, I looked at one because I was looking for, for Gainford Vicarage. I'm interested in vicarages and so on. And there is an account, not of the church at Gainford, but of the rebuilding of the vicarage uh, in 1724. There's actually a description of the old house, which is clearly a medieval open hall. And I think it's got a first floor. And I suspect, I have a feeling it's got a reference to a ladder going up to it. And this was all swept away from the building you now see right next to the church, which is 1724. And even they've got a an architect mason uh, mentioned as well uh, and that's one of those rare things because most of these faculties are about churches and church alterations and stained glass and whatever but here is a, one of, a, of a, uh, a vicarage being rebuilt which is really good well it's such a nice afternoon i'm sure we're all keen to get outside um there is an idea of updating the, the book but i think you and i were meant to have done something by now I think what Martin's talk has demonstrated is how important it is to be aware of the internal fittings in the buildings because we can all see with our own eyes in Durham when things are being altered externally. The internal stuff is so vulnerable, and the people using the buildings today are rarely aware, in my experience, of quite how special the staircases and other internal fittings are in Durham. So um, it's really worthwhile promoting that, I think. Um, anyway, as we know, Martin is a Durham heritage asset. So thanks so much for sharing your um, talk with us. So thanks. No to appreciation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Are there are some spare copies of the bulletin if anyone would like.